Assalamualaikum everyone. Really happy to be with you all here on this blessed day of Juma, and to uh, be able to share um, some reflections with you all on this beautiful day that I pray will be beneficial. Um, some of what I share will just ahead of time. I want to kind of give you um, a bit of a warning that some of it is kind of heavy. Uh, what I'd like to share, but I I I intend to really bring the beauty out of the difficult situation that I want to share with you all today. But um, that's just a something for what I you know what's to come. Um, <clears throat> let me share with you all. We we'll begin this khutbah with the words of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, it's reported by Ibn Abbas that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The black stone descended from paradise, descended from Jannah, and it was whiter than milk, but it became black due to the sins of the children of Adam." Okay. So I'll say this in Arabic as well, just for the barakah of reciting the hadith of the Prophet, you know. عَنِ ibn Abbas قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَزَلَ الْحَجْرُ الْأَسْوَدُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ So the black stone descended from paradise. وَهُوَ أَشَدُّ بَيَاضًا مِنَ الْلَبَنِ And it was um, uh, more intensely white than even water itself. Uh, excuse me, than milk itself. It was whiter than milk. Adam. But the mistakes and sins and shortcomings of humanity of Bani Adam is what ended up blackening it. Um, I share this report to kind of kick off, kick us off today to, to highlight that we're certainly in a time when the sins of Bani Adam the mistakes and the shortcomings and the follies of Bani Adam, of, of, of us collectively as a humanity, um, is very clear for us all to see. Um, and that we can see it sort of deepening and darkening the more we open up the news channels and are aware of all of the wrong and the harm that's occurring in the world right now. Um, we're more acutely aware of the, this fact that indeed the sins of Bani Adam are collecting. Um, we're, and we're also living in a time when truth is um, purposely being obscured and purposely uh, so by the powerful and arrogant powers amongst us. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this religion of Islam. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guaranteeing us that the final victory is always with truth and with beauty. And that the truth will prevail no matter how much those who are really embodying kufr in the world right now, this uh, deep ingratitude towards the creator, um, a outright rejection of their fitra, their God-given um, um, God given nature and disposition, which can see basic truths of goodness uh, if they choose to that this embodiment of kufr, which also tries to conceal the reality, that's one of the meanings of kufr, is concealing reality and in gratefulness. That no matter how much people that are embodying this reality despise it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the truth will always be victorious. Um, let me now transition us to what I was kind of speaking on earlier when I said that some of what I share may kind of be a little bit um, heavy for us today. Um, you know, we may have heard the news of the six-year-old uh, girl, Palestinian child named Hind Rajab, you know, really a child of this ummah um, who was um, being comforted by emergency personnel in Gaza. Um, she was being comforted on the phone um, for about two hours while she was trapped in a car with some uh, of her family members who were dead. And um, she was on the call, essentially uh, waiting for the medics to arrive. And on the way, the ambulance is attacked, or at some point, the ambulance is attacked, and it's not able to reach Hind. 
And his body is later discovered in that same car where she takes this phone call. And I think many of us on this Zoom call are probably familiar with this incident. Um, but there's an audio clip that was released of that conversation between that um, young lady and the medic between Hind and, or not the medic, but the, the you know, the, the operator that's trying to help her reach uh, or, or uh, keep her on the line until the medics get there. And that audio, audio clip, if you're able to listen to it, if you have some emotional room to listen to it, um, there's a lot there, I think, in terms of just lessons, and it is heavy. So again, it's to your discretion when and if you haven't, if you have, you know, to, to take to take a listen to it. Um, but I, in in the course of this khutbah, plan to actually do uh, share it with you in terms of the dialogue that occurs. And I want to do that not to bring you down, not to bring you down, but to actually point to the beauty and strength that becomes so ever visible, so apparent to us as we go through the dialogue between this um, um, uh, young girl of six years old and and this the, the operator that was on the line. Um, and, you know, I, I purposely, if you notice when I said this in the beginning of this story that um, after, or, uh, you know, when I was kind of giving the summary that the ambulance is attacked and Hind's body was later discovered, I did, I was careful not to write today that Hind died, you know, and I did that for a purpose, you know, Surat al-Baqarah, uh, verse 154, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillah rahim Allah Ta'ala reminds us, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Right. Don't say this is Allah saying to us, don't say of those who are killed on the path of God that they are dead. Don't say that they're dead. Rather, they are alive. They are living. But you don't perceive that. And the reality is, you know, that Hind is living. She is living and she's being provided for by her creator. That's the reality. And that's what I want to center is that she is living and the dialogue that I'm going to share with you all is really a dialogue of the truly, those that are truly alive, those that are truly alive, whose hearts are fully alive. Um, and I want to sort of focus on the type of care that's provided in this phone call. And I'll pull it out, you know, once I share the dialogue with you all, I'll pull out some of those key points that I think are just um, so worthy of our attention in terms of instructive for us in the way we um, bring ourselves both to the situation more broadly, but also to the way we can be with one another. So here's, you know, again, as I said, uh, I hope this is not too, too heavy for us, but I do want to share the dialogue. So um, the conversation begins with the operator confirming that the people in the vehicle have are in fact dead and the child said yes they are um and then she goes on to say are they now with you in the car and she says yes um where are you hiding right now where are you currently seeking protection like uh and she says in the car and so she again you'll notice that she keeps asking her questions and reaffirming she said you're inside the car you're inside the car, right? Not outside of it. And she's like, yes. <clears throat> she's like, okay, good. You need to stay in the car and I'll continue being with you on the line and I'll continue speaking with you and I'll, I won't hang up the phone. Okay. And she's like, okay. Um, then the girl says, the child says the tank is now beside me. And the operator says the tank is where? And the child says beside me. The tank is beside you. Yes. Is it moving or has it stopped? Has anyone gotten out of it? She said, yes, it's moving. Is it, it, it is moving? She says, yes. Okay, is it moving beside the car or is it coming from behind the car or from in front of the car? And she says, the front of the car. The tank is coming from in front of the car? She says, yes. Is it very close? Yes, very, very close. And is it moving? Yes. All right, we don't want to be afraid. Stay with me. 
I'm with you, my dear. I'm with you. I'm with you until someone comes to get you. I will not leave you alone. When someone, and then now this is the child responding to this affirmation. She says, when someone comes, can you hang up? Uh, when, when someone comes, you can hang up the phone, okay? And the operator says, what? She, she says, you can hang up when someone actually arrives. She says, no, 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 I'll stay with you. I'll stay with you until I'm sure that it's someone from um, the Hilal or the Red Crescent or someone else who's going to come to get you. I won't hang up the line. Even if the army comes, God forbid, don't hang up. Keep the line open. We don't want to lose the connection. I'm with you, my dear. I'm with you. At this point, the child, uh, you know, starts to fear. She says, please come take me, please. Um, and the operator says, yes, my dear, kind of questioning. And from what I could make, Allahu Alam, of the operator, I feel at this point, the operator is simply trying to ensure that their emotions are not, um, you know, a fear for, for the child is not coming into the, um, coming into this conversation. So I almost read it as some of these questions and repetitions, uh, what did you say, are a way for her to buy some time to just keep herself composed through this process. But this is kind of how I read it or my interpretation. She says, so when she says, please come take me, the child, she again questions, yes, my dear, like, what are you saying? Then she says again, stay with me, please. And then she says, my da darling, Habibti, I swear I'm here with you. I won't leave you. Is it almost night? And then I, I felt like I could almost hear the, the operator choking up and saying like, what? Like, what are you saying? Um, and then the child says, the night is approaching. I'm scared. Please take me. And then she says, Habibti. And you can see now this is such a powerful statement. And I think all of us feel this. If it were in my power, I would come to you right now. If it were in my power, I would come to you right now. And then she says to the child, should we pray to God at this moment? She says, should we should we talk to God? And then the child just, she, she leads the child. She says, Ya Allah. And then the child says, Ya Allah. And then she says, Ya Rab, please protect us. You know, and you can hear the child saying, Ya Rab, please protect us. Um, and the audio clip that I was listening to concludes here. Um, so I want to now maybe we can take a minute just to take that in because I know that was a lot um, before I unpack some of what I wanted to unpack. Okay. Bismillah. So what I wanted to reflect on in regards to this dialogue is just, you know, we're witnessing the decadence of humanity right now, the sheer moral depravity of the powerful institutions, economic and, you know, state institutions in the world right now that are dysfunctional to the point of just moral depravity. That's really what we're witnessing. Um, but I think what this story highlights, if we really pay attention, is that that's not the only thing that we're witnessing, that we're also witnessing some of the most um, powerful moments of humanity and the most beautiful moments of what it means to be a human being, and particularly within this tradition of Islam, within this religion, this great religion of what it means to have a connection with God. I think we're seeing that as well. Um, so in this sort of deep darkness, we are seeing some of the most, the, the brightest lights of faith and the brightest examples that we can take a lot of lessons from. So with that, you know, one of the things that I don't know if I captured very well was the way the operator engages this child was so touching um, just by virtue of the fact that they're constantly gentle with the child they're engaging with the child at the level that's appropriate for their age. They're repeating and they're questioning um, to assess the situation with great gentleness and composure and again and again to, to, to figure out what's really going on. Um, 
So that was one thing that I feel was was very beautiful about this moment of care that was being delivered. Um, then the other thing um, was this deep sense of um, withness, you know, that I am with you that she expressed. I'm with you. And if I could, I would be there to take you out of that situation. And she's constantly reminding her throughout the phone call that, you know, I'm with you. Um, um, she's constantly saying, um, you know, I'm not going to leave you. Let's not hang up the phone. There's this beautiful companionship that she offers this child in this moment, this beautiful withness and togetherness that's so powerful and beautiful that, you know, in these mo last moments of this child's life, she had this companion, you know, and really a heroine of this story. It's it's quite beautiful. And that's not even me touching on the the, the strength of this child themselves, you know. Um, so that, that was another point that I think we have a lot to gain from is that how do we accompany each other? And do we give the kind of beautiful sohba that we're witnessing here to each other or to people that are in distress that are in our sphere of influence? Um, the other part that I think is so important is that, you know, there's a lot of dwelling on ourselves that we do in this culture. Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes it's easy to spot when it's on the positive spectrum, when we're being arrogant and thinking a lot of ourselves and we kind of, our persona shows that, or we, we display that uh, a grand self aggrandizement, you know, uh, publicly. And in those moments, it's, it's kind of very clear that, you know, you're not being selfless, so to say, but then there's another opposite end of the spectrum that, you know, uh, we fall into where we're overly concerned about ourselves in a negative sense, like, oh, I'm so terrible. I'm so this, I'm so that. And there's a way in which that's still really centered on ourselves, you know, and what's, exemplified beautifully here is that it doesn't matter what we think of ourselves you know for for those of us that struggle with these negative emotions one thing that I think is very beneficial is to say not only does it not matter what others think of us it also doesn't matter much what I think of myself but what matters is what I'm doing to help others around me um, that is fundamentally there because we're all nobodies before Allah SWT. we're all nobodies it's not that important. What's important is that we really step into trying to be there for one another and serve one another. And so here, I feel, especially in this expression where this operator is holding back her emotions, um, trying to be present in this child. And I can, you know, I am 100% sure that I wouldn't be able to do the job that this operator did in providing care to this child in that moment. Uh, and I work as a as a chaplain, and I know it's just it's beyond me, like what I'm witnessing and what we're all witnessing. So that sense of being able to hold back in the time where, you know, you're really trying to support someone else. Um, and then what's even more striking to me in this dialogue was that the operator doesn't necessarily hold back the truth of the danger of the situation to this child. Um, she says in 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 the line that I shared, uh, at one point she says, even if the army comes, and she's talking about the Israeli army, she says, even if the army comes, God forgive, God forbid, don't, uh, don't hang up, keep the line open. We don't want to lose the connection. Um, I thought that was also very powerful that she is, um, she is, she's not lying to the child about the gravity of the situation either. Um, you know, while she's trying to comfort her at the same time. Um, I thought that was also very powerful. And, and I know that's a little bit perhaps difficult to hold or understand. But, you know, the, the graceful way also at the end of the audio clip when she shifts, and this is the last point that I'll say about this, is that she directs the child to God. Um, she says, should we pray to Allah? And it comes at that moment where I think they're both really experiencing that sense of powerlessness where she says habibti if i if it were in my power i would come i would come there and i would take you out of that situation um that line is just so striking and it's right after this that she's you know so organically and naturally you know says should we talk to allah and she says ya allah and leads the child in prayer 
Um, and the child is able to receive that, which is very striking to me as well. So there's all this awareness of the gravity of the thing, but there's also a way in which they're still able to maintain consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that's not resentful, in a way that's not unhealthy or weird, you know, but actually something that proves nourishing for them in that moment. And it happens in this moment of powerlessness that, you know, that remembrance of God is what holds them, you know, and solidifies that witness that she's trying to establish with this child throughout the phone conversation, you know, that I'm with you and Allah is with you and we can talk to Allah and we can ask Allah to protect us. Um, so I say these things um, to you all and I hope that, you know, we can take something from some of what was shared, especially, you know, I think this line of Habib, if I were in my power, I would come to you. You know, letting that settle in our hearts for what it means to how we respond to this issue in Palestine and Gaza, but also to other issues that may be very striking that we might not also hear about stories that may um, we just may not run by, but that are still occurring on this earth that we as Muslims really should and believers should um, have the sense that if it were in my power, I would be there to get you out of that situation, you know, and that we translate that sentiment into some form of action, some form of speech, some form of influence. Um, and, you know, I just, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us the furthest from being complicit um, in these kinds of things, in these dire crimes, that he continues to guide us, strengthen us, and to maximize, that he enables us to really maximize all that we have of influence of, of speaking up, of donating, of educating, uh, to do whatever is in our power to confront these sins of humanity that I began this talk with, um, with beauty, you know, and resilience, with courage, with wisdom, with strategy, with creativity, um, that we can get beyond ourselves, come together to do something powerful, to, to, to kind of confront the reality that's before us. Because um, we certainly can't stay silent, and, and we certainly cannot turn away from these sorts of things and especially this situation let me end inshallah with a narration from the prophet وسلم, that i think is a beautiful reminder especially after having shared something very heavy with you all um again i'll recite it in arabic just for the barakah and the blessings um an uh, abi hassan qala qultu li abi hurayrata innahu qad mata li abnani فما أنت محدثي عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بحديث تطيب به أنفسنا عن موتانا قال قال نعم so he says <clears throat> prophet صلى الله uh, actually let me continue the hadith in Arabic and then I'll translate صغارهم دعاميس الجنة يتلقى أحدهم آبا أو قال أبوي فيأخذ بثوبي أو قال بيدي كما آخذ أنا بصن... بصنفتي ثوبك هذا فلا يتناهى أو قال فلا ينتهي حتى يدخله الله وأباه الجنة So this narration is narrated by a man that approaches one of the companions of the Prophet رضي الله عنه أبو هريرة and he tells the man, Abu Huraira, he says, would you narrate to me a story or anything from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that would soothe our hearts, okay? This man comes to him because he says, my two, ch sorry, the beginning of this hadith is, my two children have passed away. My two children have passed away. Can you relate to me something from the messenger that would soothe my heart and give us some coolness of the heart? Um, to deal with this loss, right? And so Abu Huraira, the companion, says, yes, I can. He says that the Prophet ﷺ has said, small children are the fowls of Jannah, uh, a kind of bird. So they're like the birds of paradise, to paraphrase a bit. If one of them, if one of these meets his father or his parents, he would take hold of his garment. Or he said, uh, with his hand, as I take 
or like he would take hold of the parent's hand. And then he says, as I take hold of the hem of your cloth, right? So he's kind of making it real for this person that's bereaving this loss. He's saying, just as I'm taking your cloth, this is what it's going to feel like when this bird of paradise, this child of yours comes to you in the next life and takes hold of your garment and takes hold of your hand. And it says, and he, the child, would not take off his hand from the garment until Allah causes his father to enter or parents to enter into Jannah. So let me conclude here by reminding us that indeed, you know, Hind is alive and well and that inshallah ta'ala she is just as this hadith described amongst the birds of paradise that will take her parents into the garden that's promised and is a reality inshallah and that Allah enable us to be people that have alive hearts that are not blinded, that are constantly struggling with ourselves, really wrestling with ourselves to ask ourselves what we can do to confront these realities. Barakallahu feekum. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses all of you. Thank you so much.